<laughs> Ew, Michael. Why are you beatboxing on my box set? Box set? What box set? My Endless Summer Limited Edition box set, silly. It's filled with a book that's meticulously crafted with five different types of paper printed on full color. What? It has a remastered DVD and never-before-seen photos. Wow! Where do you get that from, Danielle? Get it at the link in our bio. Hell yeah! Hey everybody, welcome to the QuiverCast! You go left, I go right Man, this wave is out of sight Going surfing Going surfing Going surfing with friends Alright, welcome back to the QuiverCast, everyone. We are stoked. Today we have a surfer and car racer, Jeff Bucknum here. How you doing, Jeff? Good, good. Thanks for having me. No, stoked. First off, so how do you label like car racing? Uh, professional car well, racing. There you go. Okay, simple. I'm yes. overthinking it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, but your background is in surfing too, which is super rad. Yeah. Let's first go off into how you got into surfing. How'd you get into surfing? I. Uh, when I was in junior high school, my parents decided to move from La Cañada, California, which is near Glendale, Pasadena, Inland. Rose Bowl. Yep. Yeah. Which I had never really gone to the beach that often, maybe once a summer. Yeah. Um, somehow, I, you know, I just remember watching, even back then, the Pipeline Masters, you know, on the wide world of sports yeah. <laughs> back then. So my parents just decided to leave the LA area and move up to Pismo beach, which was, it was a little of a difficult time because of course you have all your friends and things, but I was yeah. so, ex so excited about moving to the ocean. And I knew right away that I was going to be a surfer. Like it just, I knew that was going to happen. I um, started surfing every day. And that was kind of the beginning of my passion for surfing for the, my whole life. Wow. You're in this inland kind of smoggy, hot environment. Yeah. And then you're moving to kind of overcast central California. <laughs> right. Yeah. How yeah. much of a shocker was that? You know, it's funny. To me, it wasn't that big of a deal okay. because I do remember, man, back then that was, you know, the smog was crazy back then. It's We'd crazy. have crazy. Yeah, we would stay in from PE and everything on wow. some bad smog days. No, I think it was just because when you're younger, you don't even think about you know, how cold the water was. Like now I think about it way more than I did back. I just wanted to go <laughs> surfing back then, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Didn't even think about how cold it was. You moved to Pismo. It's yep. a small town too. You're leaving LA basically. Yeah. You're surrounded by millions of people. Yeah. So what's your first thoughts? I think even back then, even to this day, I'm, I'm a small town kind of guy. I, I just, you know, I like going into big t towns wherever it is for visiting, but as far as a lifestyle, the smaller, the better for me. So I actually oh, okay. really enjoyed it. Yeah, no, it was good. I mean, I mean, there was enough young friends, you know, schools weren't tiny, too tiny, you know, high school and things had enough people that, uh, you know, to me, it felt like I had, you know, friends. So that was fine. Didn't okay. feel that small. Yeah. Why did your parents move to Pismo? My dad, well, he was, we'll get later into this, I'm sure. Yeah. But my dad was a racing driver professionally. His career had come to an end. My parents wanted to kind of get into a smaller town near a beach and things. And, you know, back then, I mean, Pismo was a tiny little sleepy town. And, yeah. You know, Such a rad town. Yeah. What they could, you know, back then, what they could sell their house for just like, this day and age, you know, you can sell your house in some places and, and you can buy a little bit more for it in smaller areas. And, and they yeah. just took advantage of that. And that was uh, what they wanted to do. That's right. What about like just the environment more raw up there? Even if you went to the beach in like Santa Monica or something, though, I guess it would have been close. Yeah. Yeah. That part, you know, was good i mean be, if i had something to engage it on say i had come from san clemente up yes. to Pismo, i probably yeah. would have been maybe a little disappointed because you know cold water you don't have as 
many friendly waves. Um, we've got either really terrible surf, which is Pismo Beach. I'm yeah. just gonna be honest; it's hor- it's a horrible wave usually, but it's always <laughs> it's always got waves. That's yes. the one thing. Or you go to these pretty gnarly places as you go north, you know, towards uh, Montana of the Arrow and up towards Big Sur, and you get some pretty heavy, heavy, heavy surf. Yeah, of course. Was your parents familiar with like surfing or anything? No, they weren't at all. I would just, I mean, they, they were very supportive as I went, wanted to go surfing. Matter of fact, it, <laughs> I mean, this is living back in the day when, you know, my mom w- would, even she worked and, you know, what she did for, um, you know, a kid under 18 years old, the way she took care of me in the summertime was just drop me off at the beach while she went to work. And That's the way it was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, it wasn't like, you know, Oh, you have to go stay with aunt Susie or, or what have you. I mean, yeah. the, the babysitter was the beach Yes, and we just stayed there all dang day until she got off work and then picked me back up. So it was actually great for her and <laughs> great for me as well. Was there a group of guys surfing and gals surfing? Yeah. You know, I mean, your age. Yep. So we were fortunate in uh, Pismo, the high school is a Royal Grande high school. And the principal at that time, Mm -hmm. he had four boys and they all surfed. And so that just turned into our era of that high school. We had to this day, we had the biggest surf club. Even today, they don't have even close to as big a surf club as we had. Everybody, even though it was a small town, there were more like surfers in groups and things and the, and the rivalries between these two shapers. I mean, we had a community. It was was crazy. It isn't even that way anymore right now. Which sucks. Let me ask you this. Who took you surfing for the first time? Or did you like bum a board off? And what kind of board was it? (laughs) Cause you kind of started later than the kids today when they're four years old and they're already ripping. Well, the first thing I got was, of course, a boogie board. Okay. And then that lasted about two weeks. Um, Then I bought a used board from Central Coast Surfboards that was in San Luis at the time. Mm -hmm. Then right away, I started having surfboards made from who's the only person that's ever made boards for me is PJ Wall. Okay. uh, Yeah. So he started making me boards. The first time was me. I had a boogie board. I grabbed my bicycle and I rode down to the, the beach and just literally got tossed around and things, but started to learn quickly about the ocean. Um, but then, not trunking it, right? No. God, okay. No. Yeah, so you got yeah, a wetsuit so too. <laughs> yeah. I bought, I bought the stuff necessary. I mean, it, you know, you, you, I can't even remember where I got the wetsuit, but I do remember getting the, the boogie board. And then a, the first surfboard, my, my mom and dad took me up to central coast surfboards and got me a used board. Yeah. What wetsuit company? Do you remember? Yeah. I, the first wetsuit. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, you the, don't know. Okay. No, the the first wetsuits that I started to buy was Hotline wetsuits from Oh yeah, Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. Yeah. Yeah, right. So that okay. was the the first like ones we really they seemed to back then were focused, you know, other than O'Neill, were mm-hmm. focused on, you know, proper cold water wetsuits, you know. Yes. How far back from the beach were you? 2 miles from the beach. Oh, okay, so it's a little bike ride. A lot of hills there. So downhill on the way there and uphill on the way back. So all these other group of kids, you had this big, huge surf club. Were they supportive or were they like, was there a lot of shit talking going on? So we had the perfect rivalry. So there was PJ Wall, Shaper, and yep. Jerry Grantham, Shaper. Okay. And th- there were two groups. And one group was... Uh, I mean, I guess the easiest way to explain it is, you know, PJ to, the, to this day, he's a he's a Christian man. He does a lot of, you know, Bible studies and things like that. Yes. Um, Jerry Grantham was exactly opposite, whatever you want to think. <laughs> okay, I got gotcha. you. Exactly opposite. Okay. Uh, and that was the crew, you know, of guys. You either had a JG surfboard or a wall surfboard, and you were identified basically on what you wrote. And your behavior reflected yeah, that. Sure. Absolutely. Wow, uh, that's that's trippy. Yeah, very, very much. Um, I was actually just in the water. I, this this will kind of sum it up. Okay. In the water, so the main like aggro guy that was the local that would you know everybody has one that would beat everybody up or what uh-huh. have you, and he got all the ways because he did right. Yeah, he's a tough guy. And, yeah, that was Robbie Ardiaga was the guy's name. Okay. And what was great is 
you, as long as you gave him waves, he'd leave you alone. You take your waves. But if anybody from out of town would come into town and start hassling mm. any of us, even if we were wallboard guys, yeah, he would absolutely take care of us. So that was the beautiful thing about having this little niche local group. So it, you, there truly was localism going on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it was a, so you knew he was going to cover you if that's if cool. somebody from out of town. So you're like, Robbie, <laughs> <laughs> and he took care of stuff. Yeah. It was awesome. Wow. Okay. So your group of friends were reflective of the, of the guys you got boards from. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if and I've ever heard that before. That's interesting. You know, when you're in Pismo, even though Morro Bay and Cayucas is close, it, mm -hmm. it's just not, it's just not down the street, you know. So no, not, it's around the bend, literally. Yeah, you got to go inland through San Luis, back yeah. over. Yep. So well, you're just isolated, and so th that was we were in our own little world. So since you're talking about that, you're surfing the pier most all the time, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if you're supposed to say this or not, but what about Shell Beach? Is that opened? Yeah, we would surf there. Yeah, obviously, you, you. So the great thing about Pismo. I don't even know that there's ever a day you can't surf it. I mean, yeah. it's it's rarely good, but even if it's tiny, there's waves you can ride. Even on small boards, you can hop enough and still do some turns, you know. Okay. But Shell Beach, it's got to have some size. Yeah. It's on the reefs and things. It doesn't take huge, but it's got to be overhead um, before it really starts breaking. So, of course, mm -hmm. in the wintertime, surf there more. Summertime, it's always at the pier. But the beaches face a different direction, both. Because you can literally see the bend in the beach when you're. Yeah, between Shell Beach and Pismo, it's not too far, so you're you're really not. Okay. Talking too much now. We did start to figure out as we got our licenses that you know we could drive down the beach where the sand dunes are. I was going to uh, ask you about that. Yeah, and then that changes. If it's three feet at Pismo, and you went all the way down the beach, it's good to eight to ten foot all the way down at the other end wow. because that place is directly north. Yeah. Wow, how heavy is that? really really good uh okay. heavy and good it's because the sand changes too so now you're dealing with actual large granules of sand so they would yeah. stack up and make sandbars and things where pismo is like powder so it's just yeah. it's flat that's why it's no good They're really difficult to create sandbars at pismo you know once we figured that out right away i got a little four-wheel toyota truck yeah we started surfing and so so oceano all the way down to it's called Guadalupe, but it's San Oh, yeah, Guadalupe. Yeah. yeah. Which you can still surf in Guadalupe down there. You have to drive in from Santa Maria. Or the one in. Yeah. But, Interesting. And then it goes into a parking lot. And so uh, I still surf there. It just is, if there's any real size, it's too big to surf out there. It's just. Yeah. 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 Can't surf. It's too big. Hey, what about that place? I, I don't know. It's labeled beach on the on the map where the guys get eaten by the shark. That's Surfer's Beach. Oh, that's, that's what it's called? That's, that's there yeah. down there. That's Driven down, down like near Vandenberg. Um, yes. Yeah. I won't even, I wouldn't surf there. Not even, not a chance. Because of the sharks or because of the waves? <laughs> sharks, man. I mean, I'm not, and I'm not even scared of sharks. Like I've never even think about it. Yeah. But that place, I've pulled up to it and I just. Feel it sharky? It feels sharky. Yeah. That's interesting. You're not telling any secrets here, right? No one's going to get mad at you or me no, for no, talking no. about all these breaks. No, none of these spots are. The whole yeah. stretch, like Pismo, up to the campground and everything, that I mean, I've never seen anybody surf there, ever. So the, all the local guys, you know, and again, yeah. I'm sure we could talk about some of these guys, but the good guys, Walter Cerny, he's still Yeah, yeah, I remember that guy. Today. There's a guy, Rick Gannon, myself, and in some of the younger guys have figured it out. You got to know the tides, you got to know yeah, the sense. winds, and you got to know what size. The, the funny thing is, of course, those days that we know are good, mm -hmm. we don't even call each other, and then we're all they're yeah, all there. They're all there. Yeah, that's was, rad. Even like just even like you know, two weeks ago, same thing happened. Yeah, uh, just okay. showed up, and then are all there. Yeah, that's super cool. That's true localism right there. Yeah, like yeah. the locals knowing the knowledge. Exactly. Let's go forward to today. Back in the day when it was a small, sleepy town, yeah. How have things changed in Pismo? Is there still localism? I should ask. Um, guy, there's not. I mean, I still paddle out, and I still feel like I got to like organize the lineup. Like, oh, okay, yeah, the, tell people how to be respectful, man. And, you know, I still yeah. feel like I have to explain. 
you know, you're sitting there, you watch a guy catch a wave, he comes right back out and then he goes right on the other side of you thinking he's got priority. And before any sets come in, I, I turn to him and I say, you know, I'm going on the next one, right? I go, I don't care where you're sitting. You just caught a wave. So don't even try to catch a wave. And these guys are what? I'm like, you'll figure it out. And so then, <laughs> yeah, you know, you have to, you have to do that. So they you have to address to- that, the, the yeah. situation. I think what's changed is when, uh, you know, Costco started selling these soft boards and, yeah. and this is really a college town area with Cal Poly up in San Luis. Mm-hmm. And I'm telling you, it's, you know, there are so many people in the water on weekends and it, 99% of them are all with a soft board. Maybe they're, yeah. you know, maybe their 10th time surfing. Fortunately, they do spread out, so they're not all right next to the pier. Yeah. But I don't see this group of young, you know, surfers. I listened to your podcast, part of it of Craig Komen, and just it was so, you know, so exciting to hear the old days of this group of guys, whoever it was up there was John Palmerner and Craig Komen and Tony Foster and these guys. Yeah. And then our group, we had Walter Cerny, myself and, you know, whatever else, but we were all pushing each other to, to want to be the best and do contests and things like that. But I don't see that around here. There, there's, you know, there's a couple of guys, but there's not a group. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about like a Grom group, like a group of local. Yeah. Kids? And like the next generation. I don't next really generation. see them. Yeah. 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 Don't, it's not really like, I mean, it's okay. Like if people want to surf for fun and all that stuff too, but yeah, totally. But that drive to even want to like just find good waves and like really, you know, understand the ocean and and just be a better surfer. You know, yeah. you don't have to be a contest surfer. It's not that. No, but just really, really understand the ocean. I mean, that's the beauty of it. It's more crowded, but so there's no localism. I mean, there's no. I, I don't know if the word localism is the right word, but it, it's disorganized. I guess you're saying. Yeah, it's a free for all. Yeah, I think, you know, Pismo's just become the playground for college age people. A few good surfers will go out, but I just don't see the the young crowd of young guys in the Groms, you know, all kind of cheering each other on. Um, Are there some? Yeah, but it's just not the same. Like, it's just not the same group that like we, we would just literally have a group hang out literally under the pier, you know. You knew the group. There they were. Yeah. Yeah. Times have changed, I guess. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah. When do you start progressing? So you have this age bracket where you're a new guy in town. Yeah. In high school. I mean, because uh, as I said, with the principal being a surfer and his, his, all all his boys were either slightly older than me, my age or younger. I mean, we had contests like every weekend, you know? Oh, okay. Like a school contest. Gosh, and this is, as we talk, I'm just going to tell you now, for me, I I feel like I have a horrible memory because um, I always think about what's happening next in my life and I tend to forget, like it's like a blur, you know? So mm-hmm. it, back then there was the, uh, what was the top amateur? NSSA? Race? NSSA, yeah, yeah. See, see, you had to help me out there. But there yeah. was another one, I think it was like W. WSA? Yeah, that one. Say. Yeah, okay. So I did a few of those events, but I pretty much just hung in Pismo and just did local contests and stuff. So that was good and bad because I won most of those thinking I was something pretty special, but yeah. I was getting an eye opener of just how good, you know, guys were down south, you know. I get that. Yeah. But you're doing well in contests, so you start traveling a little bit to surf? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. A lot of my travel started coming with – um so just by chance in my area was Aaron Lloyd, who okay. back then was a staff photographer for Surfing Magazine. Yes. And, you know, he was uh, very innovative of most of his shooting was from the water. So, you know, most guys stood on the beach with their big lenses and things like that. But he purposely always went in, in the water everywhere. I mean, okay. whether it be in the cold water up here. We would travel to Hawaii. He would always be in the water, always shooting from the water. He was getting great shots and he always needed to work on his craft. Yeah. So I was always willing to pick him up at 4.30 in the morning and then go drive somewhere before as the sun was popping up. So we get the perfect lighting. So I got a lot of 
pictures and different things. So that became kind of the next focus for me was not necessarily contest, but more just doing the photo shoot stuff. Uh, working with the photographer. Yeah. How was that? What did you think of it? Yeah, I mean, I loved it. I mean, he was a great guy, still super good friends with him to this day. He just actually moved to Maui where one of his oldest boy lives. And he just, you know, for me, he was like, he wasn't old enough to be like a, I had a dad, so he's not like a dad to me, but he was like a older, older brother. Yeah. Right. Okay. That makes sense. And I just felt he was so wise, you know, and, you know, and I thought he was so old cause he was, he was like 32, you know? Yeah. And I'm 17, 16, 17, 18. Years yeah, he's old. an adult and you're still a, a kid. Yeah. Kid. I'm a teenager. So, yeah. uh, you know, I'll just tell you one story. We did a, a shoot for surfing magazine. We went to Peru. They sent us down there with Chris Burke, Walter Cerny, myself, Lonnie brothers. And then, um, this guy Clyde, I forget his last name. After we were there, we did a whole two months and did this whole travel up and down the coast wow. and got, yeah, we, we actually got this one wave that was amazing. It was just left. Wow, I mean, everything, everything's a left down there. Cause you're on the other side of the equator. Right. So rad. Yeah. As we were done, Aaron, told you know he said hey you, you know you guys we should stay another week and go up to Machu Picchu and, I, mm. and I'm like what I'm like I want to get home he's like listen you're probably never going to be coming back to Peru like even if you do it, it may be years down the road and I'm thinking I'm going to come back here like 20 times come on man yeah but then I said you know what okay I'll do it and you know I look back into this day I've never been back to Peru wow yeah I'm so happy I went to Machu Picchu and yeah and stuff thing so it's just stuff like that that he it was really great to have him around and kind yeah. of help guide us because he was just enough older he knew kind of things that we didn't know yeah yeah that's, that's a good story actually yeah so are you in surfer magazine and surfer magazine then surfing because that was who he's a staff photographer for so my, I, was, I got a handful of pictures in so surfing cool. magazine yeah yep. well joy brand started the P psaa pro yep. tour which was Super good for us Californians because it was mostly California contests. Mm -hmm. So I thought, uh, yeah, well, of course I'm ready for this, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna go be a pro surfer. And quickly got humbled realizing that, <laughs> 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 although I was a pretty you know much a hot shot in my hometown, I really hadn't done enough contests to really be a good contest surfer. Not not even a chance. What'd you think of the other guys? you know, other guys were so good. Right. I okay. mean, so I did that and then I'll bring up Walter Cerny again. He chose to stay a, as an amateur and I'm thinking, Oh man, why are you staying an amateur? We can all go pro. And then he ends up winning the world championship, amateur championship, whatever it was. I forget back then, but it was the amateur world title yes. contest. He stayed on the amateur tour for a, a couple of years and honed his skills and then yes. ended up winning the amateur world title. And meanwhile, I'm floundering, just getting my ass whooped in, in the, the pro stuff and, and get also losing confidence too, you know, at mm -hmm. the same time. I look back and I did it all wrong is what I'm saying. You yeah. know, it's okay. It was great. I mean, I have lots of stories and it was super awesome that I got to do those things, but I definitely didn't structure it properly. Walter did a much better job of that. And he of course did much better in contests because he really understood how to navigate heats and things like that. Did you have any rivalries? Like, was it like, did you have a guy in the heat and you're like, Oh shit, I got to beat this guy. Or was everyone? Um, <laughs> this is going to go back to where my memory is just horrible. I'm, I don't remember things like that, but I remember being like, I would say there were many contests in the PSAA that I didn't even make it out of my first heat, you know, yeah. and it, you know, I could be sitting here patting myself on the back. I don't feel it's because I wasn't a good enough surfer. I feel like I was a good enough surfer and guys told me that I was, I just didn't know what the hell I was doing in the heats. You know, I, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. I didn't time the heats properly. I didn't manage them. I wasn't catching the right waves or waiting for the right waves. You know, so it, it, it devastated me. And I just, you know, I was getting less and less confidence in myself. And um, and ultimately, I'm sure it's something we'll get to talk about. It just sort of helped me transition into a, a different career. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Your dad being a professional car racer. Yep. What was he thinking or saying to you? Were the sports overlapping? 
Yeah. So he was super supportive because, of course, you know, it's not the most average job to be a professional car racer, you know, um, yes. racing driver. So he had to go after a passion that he wanted and his parents supported him, my grandparents, um, and he was extremely successful. So when I decided to go surfing professionally, he just told me, well, I, you know, that sounds great. Um, and he said that just make sure if you're going to do it, do it all the way, you know. So okay. so my idea of doing it all the way was was jumping ahead of myself and jumping yeah. into the pro ranks too soon, you know. So that was my mistake on that part. But no, he was very super supportive. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Totally, totally supportive. You have this diminishing surf career. Is that yeah. the right words? That is. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah. Very but good. you're having fun too, right? Or are you just bummed? Uh, yeah, no, I'm enjoying it. Cause I'm also mixing it up with going to different places like Puerto Escondido, and yeah. Cabo, you know, doing photo shoots with Aaron Lloyd, going to Hawaii, Maui, Oahu, you know, doing all kinds of shoots. So that made it good. Right. Yeah. But the, you know, the key was this, I started to get, and this is just a personal thing. I started to get a frustration of being judged and, um, mm. it's kind of why I chose another path, my profession, um, as a professional car racer. Cause I thought, you know what? I'm, it's not about judging. Nope. It's like literally who's lying. Yeah. Whoever crosses the finish line first is the winner. They could hate you, like you, whatever, but yeah. you're still the winner. You get the trophy. Yeah. So, That's um, cool. I took, well, that's, again, that's the way I, I think I, I look back at it now and I did run from it a little bit. I was kind of blaming the judges for judging. Well, of course I, they pretty much judge correctly. I mean, okay. you watch any contest, you know, but, but I was using it as an excuse and it's fine because my life still turned out pretty, pretty awesome as far as my other career. Yeah. But um, it is what kind of pushed me towards wanting to try something else and, just because it was a family history of, of car racing, I thought I wanted to give that a try as far as being a, a professional car racer. Yeah. So before we jump into that, it's fascinating because surfing is so subjective. Yeah. There is judging and you can clearly count the turns. Right. But how good is that turn? You right. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So, yeah. 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 And it, I, in some respects, and I love pro surfing, watching it and, and judging myself, really like yeah. being a couch dude saying, you know, so-and-so should have got this, but whatever. Right. It's hard to be a sport when it's sub subjective, I would say. Yeah. It is yeah. truly an art, surfing. It is. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it is. I agree. And and I think the thing that's happening right now, because I, I still, I there's not a contest. I watch the Pro Tour now, the WSL. I watch every, every contest. Um, I watch, I just... I follow auto racing and I follow surfing and I see every one of them. And what I'm seeing happening now is the kids, even the young kids, the first thing they're learning to do is, you know, throw an air um, yeah. and they get really good at it. But then what's missing is the rail game. You know, very few guys can throw it on the, I mean, you know, you got John, John Florence who can throw a rail. You got Jack Robinson who's good on this rail, you know, and most of the top, guys can do the rail but even like Philippe Toledo that was the last thing he needed before he won a world title was really work on his you know bigger surf rail game because he could throw an air all day long but right. the last thing he had to really was the carving part of the his surfing and he did and then he won two titles you know talk about that some people say Gabriel has no rail game but Jordy does you know? yeah <laughs> yeah I guess yeah. once again well Jordy definitely does I mean yeah that, that, that guy's like it's funny but he doesn't have a world title no no yeah no it's and that's uh, there you go back to you know some people they do they just know the art of the contest better. yes you can't say Jordan's strategy not, yeah absolutely unbelievable so yeah it's, a, it's an interesting thing right yeah the whole totally thing. you said you were starting to work more and more with photographer yeah did your style change from being a contest surfer in a heat to going down the beach or going up north or Peru and surfing in front of a camera? I don't know that it changed that much, but I learned new things about just shooting with a guy, especially when he's in the water. I mean, you know, you didn't realize how much you're, when you pull in a barrel, how much you're puffing your cheeks, holding your breath. You know, until you get, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you would just hear literally, you know, back then it was, it was, That's it was. Funny slides you know it wasn't like digital cameras so it, it would actually cost money to develop something and he would get so pissed off at me when we yeah. had a per perfect shot and then 
I, my my cheeks were all puffed up, and he would just you know flick the 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 slide at me, saying, "Well, you just blew that cover shot." You know, oh so. shit, yeah, that's fascinating, right? Because so then you had to learn how to breathe correctly or how to posture yourself. I exactly, guess. you had to look like you're in the picture. You're basically standing still, but in motion, you got to think about what you're doing for that split second. So you know, so that part was good and especially when you're working with a guy in the water, if he's just trying to get a, you know, a tube shot, you know, mm-hmm. all you have to do is drop into a hollow closeout right next to him and it could look like the best wave in the world. So as long as you, your timing with him is good and you're, you're not puffing your cheeks and you're close enough to him. We did so many of those things on beach breaks where we would constantly just right after it closed out, we'd come up and underwater we're banging heads. And yeah. Knees elbows <laughs> but just super stoked because we just got an awesome shot you know you ever have any like dangerous situations where it's like pretty big out or something and you're at some weird break where um uh, sh- was shooting with him yeah or, or just, just shooting in general. general yeah shooting in general you know I, no i wouldn't say that too much uh okay. i mean we definitely went to some places where it was just hefty hefty closeouts but mm. you know there's an art to that, right? I mean, you, as far as how you pull into something and then yeah. how you, you let the board drop into the, the cavern of water or that where right where the lip hits and then it just, the board disappears. And then you just, you know, you just figure that stuff out or you start, yeah. you pull out the back right after you pass them and stuff, you know, go past them and things like that. So, but nothing, nothing I would say was like dangerous or anything. What about just surfing closeouts? Do you ever like, I'm over this? I want to serve a good wave. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I was so kind of stoked on doing the shoots and stuff. Okay. When, we, when I was with him, I was happy to. You do had a game plan, whatever. yeah, because he was, you know, he's most most photographers, you know, that are good. They're partially they're they're um, artistic, right? So yeah. he had an idea, right? He needed the lighting to be right. He needed this wave. Okay, we're going to go to this surf spot because the sun, when its sun pops up. And it's a right hander. It's gonna the, the sun's gonna shoot right right into the barrel, right? So yes. I, I was really happy to work with them on stuff like that. It was great. When the wind wasn't right and the light wasn't right, or the the sun or whatever, did he yeah. go surf with you guys? Oh yeah, no he he uh, he's a waterman. He's uh, he does stand up paddle boarding. He does he'll boogie board, body board. I guess is what we call it now, right? Yeah, and he'll long board. Yeah, so he's he's just a waterman to this day. I mean, he's seventy something years old now, and he's in the water pretty much every day. That's right. Yeah, right on. So it doesn't work out as a pro surfer. And what yeah. what made you change or transition? I mean, ultimately, I actually did just in free surf. I did this air aerial, came down on my ankle wrong, and so blew my ankle yeah. out, and then that put me out of the water for like six months, mm-hmm. probably a whole year to where I was competitive again. Yeah, and so during that time. You know, I talked to my dad about, you know, being a, a, a car racer, you know, pro- make that a career a professional yeah. car racer. And yeah. I made the transition while I was recovering and things. I actually bought a racing go-kart, which might sound funny, but that's kind of where most everybody starts this day and age. Yeah. I did a year of that, won the championship right out of the gate and then um, went to my first racing school. And I never really looked back at surfing as far as a career or contests um, i've never stopped surfing like it's it's to this day even over my pretty successful car racing career surfing has always been my passion i just loves i love surfing okay. i can never i could never not surf i could not race that's okay i've actually retired but i just have to surf my whole life for sure so now let's go way backwards do you want to tell us who your dad is so his name's Ronnie Bucknam. Um, he passed away soon after I started my car racing stuff, actually. He just yeah. had ill health and had diabetes and, and he didn't take care of himself. I mean, he was he lived back in the day when you smoked, drank, you know, girls, race cars, all that stuff. So I was only I was in my early twenties when he um he passed away. So he wow. although he helped me kind of get started. I was then kind of on my own to figure things out from there on that. His legacy of just the quick thing on that, he raced in a time with the Mario Andretti and yeah. AJ Boyd and, you know, the names people actually still know. Still to remember. Day. Yeah. And he was very, very successful. The nice thing was, as I came into the racing world, there was a lot of respect for my dad. And uh, I'm not saying it, I wouldn't say it really helped me, mm-hmm. but 
it didn't hurt to at least be able to navigate my way through the racing industry. That's okay. Sure. Were you interested in it at all as a teenager or? I wasn't. Yeah. Not, not even a little bit. Like, I, okay. you know, a car to me was just to get to the beach. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I had a Pinto station wagon. So oh, no, I, you did not. Uh, I did. Yeah. And it, had, it, had a shift and it was awesome. Oh, Pinto. Yeah. I haven't heard that yeah. in a while. That's, <laughs> was your dad trying to sell the racing to you? Not at all. Not no. at all. He no. He was he just happy for who you were. Yeah. And then cool. now now I will say, when I chose to race cars, um, and he was pretty damn ill at that time, his eyes changed. They they kind of lit up. Oh, cool. It was. It was Yeah, really that sounds cool. cool. Yeah. And so he came to some of my go kart races and um, you know, he was just yeah he you could just see well it was his world so he knew yes. what questions to ask me and all this different things so it was kind of cool to see this last bit of excitement in his life because you know he, he was going downhill and uh mm-hmm. he, you know so just before he passed i mean i just saw a, a real real you know um what do i want to say just a, a happiness coming over my my dad you know yeah he, even though he had a happy life it's not that it's just you know a very no happy. i get it we get it yeah yeah yeah. That was super cool. Now you're all of a sudden, you literally change gears and you go to a different direction. 100%. Yeah. So, and you find out that you're good, naturally good or? Yeah. So for sure, I will say this, like, I think this, this is one thing I've thought about. So as a surfer, I think I had all the skills, like the balance and all the knowledge and, and um, just the understanding of surfing. I would say I have average to small feet for my size okay. and i think that's a I, I truly believe that's a negative for surfers like if you have either average to slightly larger feet like mm-hmm. if you've got you know for whatever height you are your feet are actually kind of big mm-hmm. i think that can really help people now i'm not trying to blame that on why i didn't maybe do better in contests and stuff but racing right out of the gate I mean, I won my first go-kart races, the very first car race I ever raced. I won that. I mean, I just took to it so well. I don't understand why, but it's to this day, I I can drive anything. I can slide anything. I can, I mean, there's nothing I can't hop in that, you know, I just have a comfort level about driving. Wow. You get this go-kart and then you go to this car racing school. Yep. Right. And is everyone like kind of Googling over you because of who your dad is? So, yeah, in the industry, people, a few of the guys that were instructors, they knew who my dad was, Mm -hmm. Um, of course, expecting, you know, something good out of me. And fortunately, I I, I didn't let him down and quite quickly got up to speed. And like I said, jumped into this racing school series, racing series. They Mm -hmm. the school that I went to actually had a amateur racing series right Uh, yeah like i said won the very very first race i was in won many of the races throughout the whole season so yeah that was always nice to be able to to carry on sort of my dad's legacy but more importantly just i felt comfortable at racing cars and understood it there was a lot for me to learn but i got the basics of it right away yeah so i know nothing about really car racing i remember watching you know, the Formula Ones when I was like a little kid in Long Beach and right. and, and some of the other races I watch on TV once in a while. So yeah. in a nutshell, there's so many different – is there a different series of racing and kind of cars? Yeah. yeah. Can you give us a, like a lowdown Yep. we don't know so, about it? So I'll give you the, the quick 30-second lesson on, on how the it works. Basically in America, mm-hmm. you – have two pinnacles of car racing. You either have NASCAR, which most yep. people to this, at this day and age probably think about and hear about. Yes. And then there's Indy cars. So yes. the biggest race in the world is the Indy 500 right. um, Memorial day weekend um, in Indianapolis. So if even today, if you were going to go racing in America, you got to choose the path. Are you going to be a NASCAR racer or do you want to be an Indy car racer? And the differences are this, you're, NASCAR just races on ovals, turn left. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is just ovals on high banks on tracks that are basically circles. IndyCars 
do race on ovals, but most of their races are on natural terrain road courses. So in California, we got Laguna Seca up in Monterey. Yep. We have a place called Sonoma Raceway, which was Sears Point, but that's um, just up in Sonoma area, just above San Francisco. Um, and so you're talking about twisty, windy, up and down different hills. And they're usually two to three mile racetracks. And there are a ton of really good racetracks all over this country. Um, natural terrain road courses and stuff. So you've got a mix of what you do. So okay. I wanted to go, my dad raced formula one. He raced Indy cars. He raced trans am cars. It just sounded appealing to me. I didn't just necessarily want to go in circles all the time. Okay. I wanted to drive and sports cars is involved with that as well. So you got sports car racing and Indy cars. So I went that route, started off in the formula car ranks and then started to work my way up into some sports cars and then ultimately made it up to Indy cars. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Yeah, that seems more appealing to watch, too. For me personally, it's a dangerous sport. So, kind of. Okay. I mean, when my dad raced, it was 100%. I would say probably half the guys that raced died. Wow. Uh, really? Yeah. Super crazy. Yeah, pretty crazy guys. Like, for a guy like Mario Andretti, who even this day, I think everybody still knows what that yes. name is. Yes. For him to not die, my father not to die from a car race. I mean, it, it was a 50-50 shot. It really was. Um, Trippy. Yeah. By the time I started racing cars, there's no doubt you were more likely to die in a car, like say a, the rental car you took from the airport to yes. drive to to the uh, racetrack than to die in the race car on the racetrack just because of the safety of okay. it, that we have now. Yeah. Trust me, you get in a crash, you will get the wind knocked out of you. You will definitely get bruised up and stuff, but dying, not going to be something that you really have to think about. Okay. Yeah. How fast do you guys go around? Like what's the fastest you get? So yes, because I raced the Indy 500, I raced it twice. Yeah, and the literally the fastest car race in the world is the Indianapolis 500. Okay, it's just because the size of the track. It's a 2.5 mile oval. Well, they call it an oval, but it's actually a rectangle. Mm -hmm. um, the top speeds on the front straight before you get to turn one is about 240 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the difference is this though. Or the, the real key to it, I should say. It's not how fast you're going in a straight line. It's you actually turn without lifting off the throttle at 240 miles an hour. You Holy don't break. Cow. You don't lift off the throttle. So in qualifying, you have to stay flat, meaning your foot all the way full throttle around the whole oval for the 2.5. You have to do four laps. At Indy, you actually do four laps in a row. Wow. That's your qualifying. Yeah. So if you lift and control it all. Yeah, not hit the wall, right? So yeah. if you lift off the throttle, you that's fine. If you have to, you don't want to hit the wall, but that means you're not you're gonna get out qualified. You're not gonna make yeah. the field. Yeah. The only thirty three guys race that race every year. So you 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 have to get your car set up. You have to keep your foot in it for four laps. And that's so cool. uh, that's the fastest you'll ever go in a racing car, two hundred and forty miles an hour into turn one. Yeah. So the first time you went that fast, what did it feel yeah. like? Can you describe it? Well, it, it's kind of like it's kind of like the you know someone saying the first time they surf pipe or Mavericks. Or, oh, there you go. Man, they didn't do it on their first session, right? Okay. So you know you've built your way up. It doesn't feel that fast because for one, you're on a track that is made for it. You're in cars that are made for it. I have crashed on ovals at 200 miles an hour. That's when it feels fast. Yeah. Because it's it's the sudden impact, you realize how fast you're going. You know, even oh. when you're racing with guys, you're all doing 200 plus. So it's yeah. literally like you you can look next to the guy, and as you're passing him, you're only going one mile an hour faster than him. So you know, it it's it just doesn't. You're not feeling that speed. It's, okay. You know, yeah, it doesn't. I'm not gonna say it doesn't feel fast. I mean, the okay. Since you asked this, this this is the biggest thing you have to get used to. Your closing rate at turning for a turn, when you come up to turn one, mm -hmm. you're covering a football field in less than a second when you're over. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So you have to look a football field up and then decide, I better turn right about now because in a second, I'm going to be at that turn. So you have to start the process of turning the car, okay. a football field in front of you. That you did have to get used to is the timing of when to turn because you're 
you just glance down at your gauges on your uh, in the car and look back up and you've already gone almost, you know, halfway down the straightaway in, in a split second. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. So that's sounds that's fun. That sounds scary. Yeah. Do this. Let's compare the two sports. Yeah. Your rival drivers and you have your rival surfers in a sports setting. Are these guys your enemies? Are they your friends or are they both? I think that part of it's kind of similar in okay. the sense of on the personality side. You okay. you have a, you have friendships when you're not competing, mm-hmm. and then I think everyone that's really competitive. I don't care once you're actually whether you're in a heat or a race. I really don't care about the person I'm competing against. There's no favoritism whatsoever, right? I mean, you just um, there to beat them. Yeah, absolutely. I you know, hundred percent. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I was pretty aggressive as a racing driver. There's no doubt about it. And, okay. and I didn't, I didn't mind being a little aggressive on the comparing of the sports. What I didn't understand, I thought, so, so in surfing, I had mentioned how I was a little frustrated with being in a judging format and, you know, felt like, oh go, you know, I didn't want to be judged mm-hmm. to, to win something. It was all just, you know, on someone else's opinion. Right. Yes. But what I didn't understand about racing was the money. If you didn't have as much money, you didn't have the, the equipment. Yes. This is one thing that I think people don't understand about racing, and, and, and it's very eye-opening. Before a race ever starts, every car actually has a capability. You may be sitting in a car that's only capable of getting fifth place, meaning it just isn't set up right. It yeah. literally can't win the race. The car can't. The only way a fifth place car can win the race is the four guys in front of you start driving terrible or mm-hmm. they crash or they do pit stops at the wrong time. But the car itself you have to quickly understand that if you get fifth place that day, sitting in a fifth place car, you did a good job. Yes. If you get fourth, third, second, you've actually done an amazing job. So that took me a while to figure out is that I wanted to win every race, but it's you, you can't. You can't win every race. You can't enter every race with a car that will win every race. It's just not possible. It's just, it's all has to do with engineering and setting the cars up and everything being perfect. It's just, you might always have a top 10 car, but you'll never go into every race with a, a race winning car. Yeah. Okay. It's nice on the days you do have a race winning car. Cause those races, when you win them, they're the least you ever work at racing. You just literally go out, do a good job and you win the race. And it wasn't even the hardest race you ever did. You know, how do you know you're sitting in a fifth place car? I mean, you kind of know the way that race weekends work is there's, it's usually a three day format. So we go like two or three practice sessions. Then we go into qualifying session uh, before we ever go into the race. And by that time you've tried every trick in the book to get the car as good as you can. And it's all time sheets on every session. And you, you basically, even if guys are kind of holding back by the time we get to qualifying, everybody's throwing down everything they have because they want to get the pole position. Right. So yes, yes. Um, you definitely know where you stack up and, and you know, if you've made a mistake, you know, if, even if you've made, let's say a little mistake and you go, you know what, I could have done about another, you know, a half second better. Even if you look at that, you'd be like, Oh, that would still only have put me fourth, you know? And, yeah. And so, you know that. Okay. So yeah, you kind of know it going into the race. So then your strategy is based on that, you know, like, Hey man, right. I've got a fifth, place car today and i'm gonna just play my strategies the best i can and i i gotta at least finish fifth you know take that fifth place or or better do you have a coach or is it this yourself talking you figure this out yourself then when you were racing yeah back then i was fortunate enough to get uh a coach that helped me understand i needed a lot of understanding about engineering with shocks and sway bars and ride heights and um, cameras and casters and different things what they did Mm -hmm. Um, and a little bit about racing strategies and stuff so i worked with a guy who had been successful with other racers and um you know he helped me a a, a ton yeah so that yeah quick learning curve on that how would you label your racing career pretty successful right well, uh, again, not having at the beginning, my dad's help to kind of help guide me. Um, yeah. I was very successful as a driver. Again, if I could go back and do it again, yeah, I would have made a few choices that were a little bit different because it was super important to be with teams. Um, cause remember I just said cars 
uh, yes. you have to have a car that can win. Well, there were certain teams that could provide you that car and there are certain right. teams that could not cause they just didn't have as good engineers and stuff. Right. Of course. So I sometimes chose to jump up a level and go with a lesser team. Um, mm. and so it kind of hurt me along the way, even though, you know, I can't complain because there's very few guys that have actually made a living at racing cars. Um, really? Yeah. That's very interesting few. to me. Well, okay. I mean, especially from all the guys that start, I would say I probably out of all the hundreds of guys that I raced the amateur ranks with, yeah, I mean, yeah. maybe two or three of us that actually made it to Indy cars. I yeah. mean, there's, there's less than a thousand people that have ever raced the Indy 500 in the entire world. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's a very, cool fact. It's a smaller group of people than the than how many guys are going to be playing in the NFL this year. Wow, that's just, that's just super this interesting. Year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah it's a small, small group of people. So to even to make it is a huge thing. Yeah, yeah. I went through my career from Formula cars. I went into sports cars, which then took me, and again, you, not being your background, racing stuff. Yeah, the other biggest race in the world is the. It, it, this endurance race in France called the 24 hours of Le Mans. So I ended yeah. I raced that race. That's another, there's just the few biggest races in the world is Monaco and formula one, the uh, Indy 500, the 24 hours of Le Mans. And then of course, NASCAR has the Daytona 500. Okay. So I did, you know, two out of the four biggest races. in Wow. Le Mans. That's awesome. Two, yeah. 24 hours of Le Mans and then the Indy 500 twice. And then I've raced the 24 hours of Daytona. There's another big race, the 12 hours of Sebring. I, I won that race. Wow. Yeah. So most people that race, they buy a car and they just spend a bunch of money to go race it. It seems like it costs a fortune. Yeah. So then how do you make a living, right? So right. I, once I got married, I never spent money out of my uh, okay. our account it only put money into our account i had to Smart. I, I was, I was married and, so i was either not gonna race you know i made a kind of a vow to my young wife back then and mm -hmm. told her that it would either pay us and make a living for us or, or i just wouldn't be a race car driver i'd have to figure something else out and, yeah. and somehow i made it and that's rad yeah and now my oldest boy is a professional racing driver how did that go uh, you know, different uh, path than you, obviously. Right. He started younger, probably. He I'm did. Assuming. Okay. He did. Yeah. And out of my three kids is the, he's the only one that has a desire for it. And I was going to be like my dad. I, I was like my dad. I, I, I didn't, I never even talked to my kids about racing cars, meaning I didn't even make that a suggestion. You know, they were growing up while I was racing the Indy 500 and while mm -hmm. I was, doing that. so they were very aware of what their dad was. Yes. Only my oldest boy, Spencer, showed a desire. And even he went through a little phase of wanting to be one, then not wanting to be one. But then finally, just at the end of high school, he just absolutely said, this this is exactly what I want to do. So he has uh, done a very good job. I told him it's got to be a business because although I'll help you, it's your career. So mm -hmm. he works on his own sponsorships. He's done two full seasons of car racing and he has won both championships already in wow. two things. And his goal is to race the Indy 500 as well, which that means if he makes it, there's only like three other families. Okay. Three generations that have raced the Indy 500. Wow. Yeah. That's super cool. That would be awesome. So I yeah. hope he makes it. That would be so I think, rad. Yeah. Yeah, and I think he will. I mean, he's talented enough to make it now. It's just a matter of the money and, and going that far. So Your one son races. Yeah. You said you had three kids. What are your other two kids? What about them? Yeah. So my, my oldest son, we, Spencer, he he races cars. Uh, I have a daughter in the middle. And then I have uh, another son. So my daughter, Ashley, she uh, lives in Arizona and mm -hmm. she's a little business lady. I mean, she's, I've never th worried about her as far as what she was going to do. So my, so my kids is ages real quick. Spencer's 24, mm -hmm. Ashley's 22, my youngest boy, Dylan's 20. So okay. um, Ashley, she's, she does all kinds of the, uh, you know, social media for companies and things like oh, that. Cool. She'll do all, yeah. She'll do all of their Instagram things and stuff like that. And then, yeah, so she's, she's building up a little business. She's, she's doing great. And Perfect. then my youngest boy, Dylan, out of the blue, he signs up for the Navy as a Navy SEAL. Whoa. 
Yeah. So he is down in San Diego right now. Oh, cool. And he is just about to graduate as a Navy SEAL. So it's actually, he's in a department called a SWIC, which it's a Navy SEAL that works. They, they more specialize in the boats, right? Okay. So your Zodiacs and stuff, but it's still a part of the SEAL category. Wow. That's hardcore. And, Oh my God! He got those guys are gnarly. Ass whooped in the whole hell week, and he went in the hospital a couple of times. But uh, mentally, he was he enjoyed the whole thing, and and uh, he's about to graduate. Oh, cool! That's yeah. congratulations on that. Yeah, congratulations because all three of my kids don't need me anymore. <laughs> <They're all doing laughs> that means you're so a successful good. dad. Yeah, hopefully I mean, that'd be great. To think about it that way. No, they're. It's awesome because yes, they're they're doing good. They're all on their own paths, um, and with uh, my Spencer, my racing driver um, son, doing great. My daughter with her small businesses, and then Dylan as a Navy SEAL. I mean, he worries me the most. Actually, just being no, that's a SEAL. super scary. Yeah, to yeah. be a dad but, and have your kid in the in the in military in the first place, but then a, Navy yep. SEAL. Those guys are like the the hardest of the hardcore. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm learning even more about it because I just never even thought about it. And he just right. out of the blue in high school, a recruiter came in and he, he just went ahead and went for it. And, and he's, he's super stoked. I'm, I'm happy for him, obviously, obviously. But it, yeah. it just was out of the blue. So, but um, yeah, so that's my three kids doing awesome and um, making me proud. That's for sure. Let's go backwards real quick. Yeah. Let me ask you this. You said you loved surfing. Did you actually love the racing? Um, I really, uh, yes, I, that I did do, but <clears throat> I think as any, you know, anybody that's listening to this, that, um, and anybody that is a surfer for many years that just loves to surf in the ocean, that's the difference, right? You're dealing with nature, you're dealing with this raw energy and just the feeling you get from surfing. I don't know if there's something about it. I could just be even sitting on an a beautiful day looking back at the the hills and things and there's just something about it right so racing i did love i loved it but it's it's one thing you can't do you can surf for fun mm -hmm. and you could be a soul surfer you can't be a soul racer the, That's the, true. the <laughs> name the name is competitive right it's yes. it's not Surfing is the name surfing. That's not competitive. You can make surfing competitive, but yes. you can't be a casual racer. I mean, you're racing or you're not. Yeah. Okay. So the stress level in racing was enormous because mm. as you went up the ranks, you were driving more and more expensive cars, million dollar cars, and you were expected to not only not crash them, but you were expected to go win and beat other people. So it was, it was very stressful. Yeah. And then results and stuff too. Did, I, did it become work? I guess is the question. Yeah. I mean, at that time I was young, you know, wanting to make the career grow. And, and I, I even look back now and I, I even started my own race team too. I had a race team because I, you know, you see some NASCAR guys do this. They race, they have their own race team, like Tony Stewart and different yeah. guys. Uh, I had a race team that I had younger guys racing on that while I was still racing and things. And, and at that time we were, you know, my, me and my ex-wife were, you know, having kids. And I, I look back, I go, how did I do all that? I mean, I don't even know how I did it. I wow. mean, my okay. life is so simple now. I can't even understand. How I did it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had to work hard to make it. Yeah. Simple. So I enjoyed it. I enjoyed that, but it was super competitive and super, like I said, super stressful, but it's what I desired at that moment in my life is the drive to, to move forward, you know, and, yeah. and, I'm, and I'm glad I did, but I surely wouldn't want to do it all over again. Absolutely not. Oh, wow. All right. You get through this career. You do pretty well. Yeah. And then how do you transition to retire? Again, that was a very fortunate thing for me too, because most guys that race cars, listen, it's like, it's like talking about surfing and talking about say like Kelly Slater. I mean, there's one Kelly Slater, right guys? Of course. Like, you, you can yeah. be a professional until you're in your fifties. No, you can't. Kelly yeah. Slater right or you can make millions at it. it's like no there are there's guys that do but you know how many tens of thousands of guys don't right or hundreds of thousands uh, of guys yes. that don't. so in racing same thing i would say even the you can look at the the top guys the max for stoppings and, and in indie cars you got scott dixon and all yeah. these other guys but most guys end up their career stalls out 
the sponsorship doesn't work out. Some younger kid comes in with more money and, and these things. And so they get kind of pushed out of their careers. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, somehow fortunate enough to hang on all the way into my 40s. Um, wow, that's cool. Yeah, and still racing and had a contract. End up finishing my career racing uh, the Camaro at, for Chevrolet for GM. And I was factory driver and they were paying my salary and, and I was doing all the testing and stuff. And the last year I raced, I was, <laughs> I was in races and right in the middle of the race, I was thinking about how I wanted to be on the beach with a beer in my hand <laughs> and catching some waves, you know? Yeah, of course. I'm right in the middle of the race. So I, I knew that was the end. Like I knew that was my last year. And so they, they put a contract out for me to come back the next year. And I just, you know, I gracefully bowed out and there were some younger guys that that were ready to step up anyways. Yeah. But I, I was happy and I've never looked back. I've never wanted to race cars again. I still drive last week out on the racetrack doing some testing and stuff like that, but um, racing. Nope. I was done. So you just knew it was your time. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. And you hear about that. Like a lot of the pro surfers too. Yeah. Whatever yeah. the reason they always have a time. I was, it was done. That's yeah. cool. But you do other things too. You've done some stunt driving. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of a fun time in my life now. So I do, I've done some coaching. I help my son. I get calls to do movies, commercials during all this. I, I, you know, I surf every week and, you know, I get to do all that stuff too. So last year we finished up um, a year ago filming the Ferrari movie that came out this last year. So my son got to do that. So he, he, he got to do that with me. We did this, all the stunt driving. Oh, cool. Yeah, there was like eight of us that did all the stunt driving in that movie, but they needed a young guy for one of the actors. And <laughs> most of us stunt drivers are like 50 something years old because so, <laughs> yeah. uh, he was doubling one of the main racing drivers in the movie. And so he was okay. fortunate enough to be good enough, sort of look like the actor. And yeah, oh, cool. Young, yeah. So he got a phone call to be a part of it. So that was great having my son be oh, a part of it. Of course. Of stunt driving thing because i did the ford versus ferrari movie as well and then uh which my son didn't do i just did that yeah that was fun too because most of those guys are all ex-racing drivers so they're like all buddies of mine yes so that's those are fun to do you guys talk about like a race you guys ran against each other ever and oh yeah 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 you did this yeah yeah Yeah. for sure how much better i am than he is (laughs) (laughs) that's cool it's kind of fun though right looking back at it super super fun you know just like the surfing world they're characters man i mean there's some guys you you can't stand to be around but you also don't want them not to show up because they're too much fun you know yeah 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 i get that yeah yeah and then there's other guys that are to the book and you know so it's uh it's a great group of guys um just because i brought it up the ford versus Ferrari movie was very cool because that movie was all about the rivalry between ford wanting to build race yes. cars against ferrari to win the 24 hours of Le Mans. well not only did he build cars to beat ferrari but he the 1966 his cars ford finished first second and third well the third place car in real life in 1966 was my dad ronnie bucknam Oh, okay. Cool. So in that movie, which is the it all comes back car. around full circle. Yeah, I drove that car, of course, in the movie because why? Oh, wow! My dad's car in the movie, but and it wasn't part of the main part of the movie, so it was only in a few scenes here and there. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because there's only a handful of us actual stunt drivers, they every scene we just sort of do a musical chairs of who's driving what car just to fill the shots, you know? Yes. Um, so yeah, there was th- two other guys that um, their fathers were. Uh, racing drivers as well so this very famous racing driver dan gurney oh yeah uh, I heard him. because orange county dan gurney okay. there um, you go. yeah and then his son alex gurney who i grew up racing with him he was in the movie because he drove his dad's car in the movie and then this other guy Derek hill who's the son of phil hill he was in the movie as well wow uh, yeah that so sounds they did, cool yeah they did the ferrari this ferrari movie gets a little confusing Ford versus Ferrari. And then the Ferrari movie that is the second movie that when we filmed in Italy. So uh, those guys did that as well. Wow. You do all these little side gigs, but what's your main gig you, in Pismo? You have a coffee shop. Yeah. And that, I'd call that a side gig too. Because, oh, side gig too. Uh, okay. I mean, it does really well. So yeah, about six years ago, I, I love coffee. I always have. I mean, we all do. I love yeah, coffee exactly. Too. And I was retired. 
when I started it, I wasn't doing a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I wanted to do something. So I just worked with this roaster guy and figured out a bunch of profiles to, to make some different dark roasts and medium roasts and whatever. Started selling online with just to see how it would go. And then I was living in Arizona for quite a few years, believe it or not. I actually had moved there when I, my racing career and stuff. And so yeah, that makes sense. Made my transition back to Pismo. I just felt this urge to, to open up a coffee shop with our coffee. And then um, we got really fortunate with this perfect location in, in town. And yeah, you know, the first couple of years, it was just trying to get off the ground and mm -hmm. trying to find the right manager and this, that. And I'm not a barista and I'm not. I'm not okay. the kind of owner that's going to be there every day. Uh, I yeah. got too many other things I do. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, between employees and manager and all this different stuff, I mean, it's great. I actually really like it. It does uh, it does really good. It's not making me rich or anything like that, but it pays right. its own bills, pays the employees. I get a little extra here and there. You know, I when I first started in a, you know, just make the quick version of this, but when I first yeah. started, I thought I was going to maybe do like five, 10, 20 shops, you know? Um, okay. And just really grow the thing. I realized just, again, how much work it all is. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, talking about how when I was younger, how much all that stuff I did. And I just realized I don't want to go down that road of just, you know, putting all the effort into it. I can I can retire and, and I don't want to have to do all that stuff. So I think, yeah. you know, at some point I will sell the business. It's It's got a nice reputation in our town and it's definitely the best coffee shop in our area. For sure. So it's Scorpion Bay Coffee, right? Yeah. So that came about because I was I gonna say to, it sounds like you surf there a lot or you like it. Yeah. Well, I go there almost every year. I'm okay. headed down there probably in a few months for usually like this time I'm going down for like three, four, five months. I'm taking a truck and camper and just going down. Wow, there. that sounds fun. Yeah. You know, I wanted a coffee company mm -hmm. that was relatable to the surfing industry. Okay. But I didn't want to be all hokey like like surf spot coffee or something <laughs> stupid, you know. Okay. And so, and I still wanted it to be kind of relatively, I don't know, where anybody would come in and like the like the name and the coffee shop and stuff, right? So, yes. literally, Scorpion Bay Coffee. Unless you're a surfer, they, I have a scorpion on the logo, right? Mm -hmm. So. Most people don't even know who, what the hell that means, right? So they just—I I guess not. Yeah, yeah. I just know who it was on my life, so I didn't well, think see, about it. Well, see, I made it really for guys like you, and yeah, surfers because of course we do get surfers in that that either have been to Scorpion Bay, want to mm. go to Scorpion Bay, right? And so it's got a cool little thing, you know. I've got pictures up of Scorpion Bay back in the days, you know, nineteen seventies and eighties that I got from some people. Um, I don't make too much about the inside. I keep it pretty simple inside the coffee shop. But okay, um, but how yeah, far back from the beach? We are perfectly situated. We're two blocks up, but that puts us right on Highway One. Yeah. So yeah, because if you have a, any business, a coffee business down at the pier, you're good on weekends, but you're horrible on Monday. Yes. Yeah, it so makes sense. On Highway One, we're good on weekends and we're good on Monday because yeah. people are driving by, they stop, they buy our coffee, and they keep going. Yeah. yeah. So, what do you, you surf in the morning and then get a cup of coffee on the way home? <laughs> but, yeah, but warm you up a little. You know, I do go in there and then get that, but I also just, of course, I'm always stocked up with our coffee in my own uh, okay. French press coffee maker. So, oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Right on. What's your next adventure? Is it's it is my trip. Like although I go down to Scorpion Bay um, every year and love going down to Mexico to surf, whether it's Puerto Escondido or what have you. Uh, I bought this four wheel drive truck. I saw that on Instagram. It's pretty yeah. sick. I bought this brand new camper that's state of the art, solar panels, lithium batteries. Got you know the kind of self sustaining. Oh, I can boondock for weeks and, and you're good, right? As long as you have food, huh? I got Starlink, so I can talk to you anywhere I am in the world. Oh, wow. Wow, yeah. that's is state of the art. Yeah, but uh, the idea is to – I've never s driven from San Diego all the way to Cabo and gone all over the peninsula of Cabo wow. like that. I've always flown down, drove partway, whatever, and I'll stay different places. But this time, I'm just, I'm just hitting the road by myself. I'm – PJ Wall's making me three different surfboards right now to add to the quiver I got. Sweet. I'm either going to have a great time or I'm going to die down there. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, 
<laughs> well, I hope you don't die. Yeah. I, I think you'll be safe. I think uh, you're going to have a good adventure. That is an adventure. Yeah. There's places, uh, of course, I I won't talk about because they are kind of secret spots that yeah. you can find out from a few guys that are super good down there, all the way down the whole peninsula, right? Yeah. Um, but that's the plan. I mean, I... Um, I'm going to, I know I'm leaving. It's actually going to be like June 1st. Okay. I have no set plan to come back, but it's going to take me two, three months to go easy all the way down because I have a buddy that has a house in Los Barillas as well. It's just oh, okay. on the East Cape side down by um, almost all the way down at the tip. Yep. And I'll hang out with him for a while, but yeah, I go all the way down to where shipwrecks is nine palms and you know, zippers. Ooh, score. And, yeah. But That's so the, cool. Yeah. So then come back and We'll see what happens after that. Right on. So this is kind of yeah. a cheesy question. In the car racing world, do you get recognized? At the track. Yeah. At the track. Okay. It's funny because in America, you could win the biggest race in the world. Right. And you could walk across the street. And I wouldn't know who you are. A 7-Eleven and no one would even know who you were. You know right. I mean? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's yeah. kind of like all the niche sports. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, well, we have in America, we have too many th- things, right? I'm not saying we have too many things. We've got basketball, we've yeah. got baseball, we've got yeah. football, we've got you know, auto racing, which is absolutely confusing in America because you got NASCAR, Indy cars, sports cars, drag racing, sprint very, car racing, yeah, yeah, motorcycle racing. Mm. So, I actually kind of love it because you don't get nagged at all. Yes. Occasionally, I'll get recognized, but I usually am have to be some around some car event or something like that. Yeah, yeah. If sense. I go to the racetrack, yeah, I can't even get through the down through the pit garages and stuff without you know at least getting pulled off to the side, which is you know which is also very humbling and nice and yeah. you know things like that. But you know, other than that, yeah, don't get recognized. Yeah, has any of the surf guys you've surfed against competitively back in twenty thirty years ago get reached out to you and said, "Oh, look at look at you." being it's, a race car driver yeah i wouldn't say reached out to me but as i went across paths and things oh, okay. um yeah su- super cool i mean i was just thinking about the other day when i was um i couldn't i can't, I can't think of who it is now but it happened just the other day and okay. um but i'm you know i'm it's it's funny i don't it, with my career and stuff i mean mm-hmm. since it's since it's over with i don't even think about myself as a racing driver i mean yeah. i know my I know my talents and I know my skills because I still get hired to do different things, mm-hmm. but I'm in my next chapter, which I kind of see myself back to a surfer. I really see myself more as a surfer. I dress like a surfer. I wear flip flops and board shorts and <laughs> t-shirts and that's my life. You know, it's just, yeah. it's the way I am. Uh, Pismo beach. Let's talk about that real quick. It's changed a lot. It's grown a lot. It's still a really small town, but the buildings that there's more businesses yeah. than there were 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Yeah, it's uh, it's a mini Newport Beach now for sure. It really is, yeah. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it doesn't matter the weekend. I mean, it's uh, you can't find parking. You don't want to drive through town. All this is super good for my coffee shop. This is why I'm, you know, yes, <laughs> it does so well. But I don't even, I, yeah, especially if it's a holiday weekend, you know, I, I just I'm in and out of there really early in the morning. Um, mm-hmm. if, even if I'm going to be surfing in town, I'll go down the beach like we talked about in Oceano or something like that. Yeah, you know, you know weekends are different, but it, it, it's inevitable, right? They built three big hotels, changed the whole scene, and that all happened right, you know, right before COVID. So right when they COVID lifted, yeah. the town just went it went bananas. Yeah, like most coastal towns. Yeah, around yeah. anywhere in California, actually now. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's nice. They do keep, I mean, they have done a nice job. They made the pier nice. They made a nice little area and things, but it's, but that's just drawing in, you know, really, really crowded, crowded town. I mean, how how else to say it, right? It's not a little, it's not a little surfer town anymore. No. Well, they, they have this event every year now. They're kind of like, it's a WSL event. Yep. It's a, it's a QS, but. Yep. Yep. uh, This, this year it was awesome the surf was actually good ever it's the best i've seen pismo and it was pumping it was pumping for like five days straight <laughs> yeah andy yeah. mckay puts that on he's a he's a cool dude okay you go down and watch it what do you think of the new crop of groms or they're not groms they're pro yeah surfers. i don't the i'll be honest coming. i didn't know any of them i remember the guy that won it this year he did either good last year or he won more obeys contest or something so i watch him for sure okay i just don't know those guys um yeah but the guy that won it 
his style i like it he he's a rail surfer but he could still do the air game okay um, i i don't i couldn't even tell you who he was but right um, I, I can't think of who it was and i do know but okay yeah he definitely did a great job yeah i mean th- these guys are good like there's so many good surfers i mean you know and, and i when i say these guys don't know how to do rail game i mean i'm just saying the focus isn't there at first, it's on airs yeah but all these guys are all good i mean it's impressive you know is there any up and coming Pismo Beach kid that has possible so, potential? The two guys that are semi pro, they have the talent to do it. Mm-hmm. But I think the, the it's just like racing. When I told my oldest boy, who's being successful at car racing, and his success is coming from the business side of it, you know, these guys need to find money instead of complaining about how they're not getting sponsored. If they want to be good, they need to just find the money and they need to they need to send themselves to Australia. They need to send themselves to different places. I mean, if I was hired, I could actually help them be, because I, it was so hard to be a race car driver. I just look at surfers these days and they're missing the point. They're thinking, Oh, well, nobody's sponsoring me. I go, well, that's because you're not going out and find the money. Like whoever finds the money. That's a good point. Well, yeah, because it's just money. I mean, if you even get your rich uncle to send you to all these different places and you have the talent, these guys, these, there are two guys here in this town. I, I feel bad that I don't know their names. But if they just um, if they just somehow got the money to go to the contest, I think they would get the qualifications to be on some of these tours. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. They are, I mean, the the surf industry has changed, and there are a lot of starving surfers out there. I mean, some of the yeah. top guys don't even have a stick. Yeah, so their find your own money. You know what I mean? It's like it, the surf industry doesn't have to be the one that sponsors you. Be creative. Maybe get a new. Maybe get some, good point. You know electric car company to sponsor you because you got to get to the beach somehow i mean be creative right no i I love what you're saying and i guess we do all just gripe oh they're killing the quicksilver's killing surfing or whatever right or billabong or whatever brand you want to put in there yeah but um that's interesting do you think that it's a good thing that they're running a contest at pismo are you happy that they are in central coast yeah i do i think it's i think it's good i mean because since the town has already become a tourist you know, yeah a tourist place anyways i think it's the right time for it and it, okay. it has become successful i mean you're not going to turn you not things aren't going to turn back around right it's not going to go to a smaller town a so. sleepy little <laughs> surf town yeah and i and i think i'm um, pretty good friends with andy mckay i mean we're not like best buddies but we're we know each other quite well and, mm-hmm. and I, think, I think he's a good guy so i think he's uh he puts the hard work into it and i think he should get paid off for it so it's good yeah cool well, Jeff Bucknum, thank you for coming on the Quivercast. Super stoked. Thank you for uh, enlightening me on the car racing. Now I'm going to probably watch it a little more. Yeah. Watch Formula One. That's okay. the number one thing. I just watched it this morning. They did their first race for 2024 in Bahrain. And All Max right. Verstappen, the best racing driver probably ever existed, just won the race again. And Indy Cars, that's America. Basically, that's Formula One in, in, in America. Yep. Uh, and that's all you really need to watch. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to do that. So thank you so much for coming on the Quivercast. I really appreciate it. This is Mike and Jeff Bucknum, and we are out of here. Thanks, Jeff. You go left, I go right. Man, this wave is out of sight. Go surfing. Go surfing. Go and surfing with friends. Ride this wave to the shore. Paddle out and I'll catch ten more. Go surfing. Go surfing. Go and surfing with friends. I don't care if it's wrong or right. I'm gonna do it all day. I'm gonna do it all night. I'm going surfing. I'm going surfing. Go and surfing with friends.
Hey, you guys, Endless Summer box set. This thing is legit. It's authentic, numbered certificate in it. It has a five-frame film strip. From the original print, you will literally own a piece of history. It has a specially minted bronze medallion. Dude, that thing's sick. Okay, there's so much more here. Go to the show notes. There's a link on there. Go check this piece of history out. This thing's rad. Seriously. Smithsonian American History Museum has it. It took four years of research with 3.5 in production. All hand assembled. This thing's rad. So much to this awesome box set. Remastered DVD. Sharper images than the original film. But dude, this thing's so sick. Link in the show notes.